This video is sponsored by Blinkist. It is very early January here, at the end of my first day back at work after Christmas, and my brain is just not in the swing of things at all yet. Like, my current draft of my paper I'm writing about my current research is just sat there open on my computer. I didn't type a single thing today, and the cursor is just blinking at me like, write something, anything. Instead, I figured let's have some fun and react to some space and astronomy memes, because why not? We might learn something in the process. I haven't seen any of these. Sam has picked them all out for me, so let's just dive on into this. All right, first one. How I see the moon versus how my phone sees it. Oh my God. That's so true, right? Like, how many times have you done that? I mean, I I know that it will do that. I know the reasons why it does that. And yet I still break my phone out every time in the hope that it will turn out different, right? There's two reasons this happened. The first one is because phones have really small detectors, which is a good thing because then they fit in our pockets. But it means that their dynamic range is very small. So the dynamic range is essentially the difference between the brightest thing and the darkest thing that a camera can detect. So when we snap pics on our phone, you know, they're designed for landscapes and selfies where the light is distributed, you know, fairly evenly. But when you have something like the moon, which is incredibly bright, again, something very dark, like the sky, and you have a camera with a low dynamic range, it can't tell the difference really between something that's that bright and that dark. So you just end up with a white circle against a black background. The second reason is because phones are designed to have wide angle cameras, right? They're designed to mimic sort of what we see. So the angle that sort of phones tend to see is about 90 degrees sort of of your vision. The moon is only half a degree in the sky. You know, the whole like you can block it out with your thumb if you hold it at arm's length. That's only half a degree. So it only takes up, what, one over 180th of your photo, which is why it ends up looking so tiny <laughs> in the photo at the end, no matter how big it appears to your eyes, which comparing them compared to like a house or a tree in the foreground, right? And it gives it that sort of warped sense of of perspective. Even knowing that, I still don't feel any better every time my photos look so bad. Pluto has a heart-shaped sea that's filled with poisonous ice. Don't we all? <laughs> oh, kudos to you, Kashana. I mean, I still kind of can't believe that like the New Horizons mission, like when it did its flyby of Pluto, like got this level of detail in this image. Just, I think just comparing it to like the previous best image we had of Pluto, right? Which was that like dirty, fuzz blob of pixels from the Hubble Space Telescope. Like it's so much more detail than we'd ever been able to see before. And this heart thing has been dubbed Sputnik Planitia by the research team, which I love. It's, you know, after Sputnik, the first satellite. It's actually a glacier made of nitrogen as well. And the thing that I love about it is that despite the fact that Pluto is, you know, a piddly, not even a planet, right? It's a dwarf planet. That glacier is the largest glacier in the solar system. So. I guess Pluto still had the last laugh. One day on Mercury lasts about 1,408 hours, the same as one Monday on Earth. Uh, yep, uh, been there, in fact, been there today as well. <laughs> it's always been one of my favorite things to like compare and contrast like the properties of the planets in the solar system. I remember I had this big fact file when I was a kid, which was like my favorite book and I'd pore over it. And I remember being like fascinated that Venus has a day, which is about like 5,000 plus hours or something, and it's longer than its year, like the time it takes to go around the sun. So the idea that there would just be this like permanent like day side on Venus and like a permanent night side, because it's pretty much rotating at the exact right speed to always keep one side facing the sun. So the same way that like we only ever see one side of the moon because it rotates at the exact same speed to always keep that side facing us. It's called tidal locking. I know that now, but as a kid, I was just like, whoa, can you imagine living on a planet like that where there's like a permanent day side, but because it takes 24 hours longer, it's not perfectly locked like the moon is. Like you, it would just slowly change year on year, like which was the day side and which was the night side. Like, can you imagine that? Like I imagine like winter is coming. <laughs> it's like a big thing on Venus. And winter is coming. Remember the sun baby from the Teletubbies? <laughs> This is him now, feel old, yeah. 
Oh, I used to watch the Teletubbies with my sister. And then I love this and I hate to have to poo-poo on it, but I just want to point out the sun will not become a black hole when it runs out of fuel and dies. It will become a white dwarf. It won't even actually go supernova. It'll just shed its outer layers and become a planetary nebula with a white dwarf in the center. It would need to be about 30 times heavier to become a black hole at the end of its life. But I'll give the authors of this meme a pass because it's hilarious. According to astronomy, when you wish upon the star, you are actually a few million years late. That star is dead. I, I mean, I've seen this making the rounds around the internet for a few years now. And I'm just like, oh, no, not really. Like, I don't find it funny because I know that it's not true. Because all the stars that you can see in the night sky they're all in the Milky Way, right? They're, they're all in our galaxy. And the Milky Way is only 100,000 light years across, but really we don't see all the stars because we're not going to see the faintest ones further, right? At least with our own eyes, there's something like 4,000 stars or something that you can see with the naked eye. So none of those are going to be that far away. They're going to be max like 10,000 light years away. And even like the brightest, the biggest, the shortest lived stars, you know, the blue, big blue stars, they live fast, die young, but they still last for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And the longest lived stars, the like the coolest little red stars, they live for billions of years. Like even the ones that formed right at the beginning of the universe, just after the Big Bang, they're like still around, you know, they're going to be around for a long time still yet as well. So chances are, if you're picking a random star in the night sky to wish upon, like it's still going to be there. Unless of course, if you're wishing on a shooting star, which is not a star at all, it's just like a lump of rock that's falling to earth and burning up in the earth's atmosphere. And yeah, okay, within seconds we'll be disintegrated. Then yeah, you you star that you wishing upon is still going to be there. <laughs> Yay, SpongeBob. Primordial black holes, stellar mass black holes, supermassive black holes, quasars! <laughs> right, so I think Sam's included this because he knows that both SpongeBob mean is one of my favourites, but it's also about black holes as well, like my one true astrophysics love. So primordial black holes are these really, really tiny black holes. They're formed in the very, very early universe when you've just got this like soup of hydrogen and you get sort of like various different particles clumping together. So you get fluctuations in how dense certain areas of the universe are. And you might end up with one area becoming dense enough to create a black hole that is absolutely, you know, tiny, you know, the size of tennis balls and smaller kind of thing. Whereas then you've got stellar mass black holes, which is what you get at the end of a supernova when a star that's maybe 30 times the mass of the sun and above runs out of fuel and dies. Then a supermassive black hole is what you find at the very center of galaxies in there anywhere from sort of a million times the mass of the sun to, you know, a billion times the mass of the sun and above. That's what I study. Bloody love them. And then you've got quasars, which are growing supermassive black holes, but growing at like an incredible, incredible rate. So what's happening is that the material around the black hole is spiraling so, 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 so fast that it heats up due to friction and it starts to glow. And some of that material is actually ejected from the vicinity around the black hole, not the black hole itself, but from the surrounding regions, just because the pressure is so great and also gets thrown back off. And we can see that from the light that it emits. So quasars are some of the brightest objects in the universe, despite the fact that they're a black hole. And I think the little buff SpongeBob representation there is all I'm gonna think of now when I think about quasars. Uh, Kepler-186f, astronomers searching for most Earth-like planet, Kepler-452b. <laughs> I feel like this is such a niche meme, like the kind that would be like posted on the exoplanet research group's office door and like the departments that everyone who came to like visit them would get a little chuckle out of it. Like for those who maybe are a little bit confused, Kepler-186f was oh, one of like the first Earth-sized planet found in the habitable zone around its star. So there was a lot of buzz created like when that was actually found, you know, the habitable zone being like the area that's like not too hot and like not too cold for life. It doesn't mean that like we could exist there or life definitely exists there. It just means that like life as we know it probably would have been able to develop because of the conditions. And if I remember right, Kepler-186f, 
was very similar to Earth, like the planet was, but the star it was orbiting was not similar to the sun at all. It was like a red dwarf star. So the planet was like orbiting like a lot closer in. It had a much shorter year. Whereas like a year or two later when Kepler-452b was discovered, that was found around a sun-like star, like a very similar star to the sun. It had very, very similar properties to the earth as well. And it just very quickly usurped Kepler-186f as like the most earth-like planet. Although I think there's a lot of people arguing now that it's, a bit more like a super earth because it's a bit sort of heavier and, and bigger and, and meatier but like I wouldn't get too excited or anything because like I'm pretty sure that it's like over a thousand light years away so don't get like too excited about visiting it because the journey would take you like over a million years. <laughs> All right last one. <laughs> favorite by far this is why he's left it till last i am such a huge avengers fan like i mean i'm practically a real life jane foster right like she's an astrophysicist who studies black holes like you know when are they gonna put me in the film for that matter when's chris hemsworth gonna fall through my sky that's what i want to know you're all not worthy so this meme is referencing the fact that pluto was downgraded from being a planet all back in the mid 2000s so like 2006 or something, and that's because in the early 2000s, we were finding all of these other objects in our solar system that were very similar in size to Pluto. And the question was, you know, does our solar system grow from having nine planets to 15 planets, 20 planets? Do we start adding all of these objects together? So the International Astronomical Union that governs this kind of thing sort of brought a load of experts together for a meeting to decide on the official definition of a planet and therefore figure out what qualified as being a planet and what didn't. Sort of distinguishing them from, you know, the rest of the rubble in the solar system, like the asteroids and comets and all of these Pluto-sized bodies. And they came up with three rules to define, you know, what a planet is. The first rule is that it has to be orbiting the sun. Fairly simple. The second one is that the object has to be in hydrostatic equilibrium, which essentially means it has to be massive enough for gravity to have been able to shape that object into something round, so that essentially gravity is equal everywhere on the surface. So instead of looking, you know, kind of like potatoy shaped, like some of the asteroids and maybe moons of certain planets do, it has to look, you know, nice and round. And the third one is that it has to have cleared its orbit. I, it has to be like the most dominant thing along its orbit around the sun. And that's the one that Pluto fails on because, you know, Pluto even crosses the orbit of Neptune and also crosses the orbit of lots of other what we call trans-Neptunian objects out beyond the orbit of Neptune as well. So that's why Pluto was downgraded. And I know people feel so strongly about this. And people were so upset at the time, which is probably where this meme has come from. It's still that leftover rage that Pluto was downgraded. But if you're gonna include Pluto in your list of planets, you've got to include the likes of Ceres and Sedna and Eris and Makemake and all the other dwarf planets that probably no one's ever heard of. So, you know, you can't have one without the others. All right, that was so much fun. If there's other like space or astronomy themed memes that you think I'll get a laugh out of, send them my way over on social media. Just help me extend my procrastination for the rest of this week and my easing back into what it feels like to work a full week again. But in the meantime, I mean, I better hop to this research paper because you know, it's still staring at me. That curse is still blinking away. <laughs> you know what? It's not gonna ride itself, is it? I just want to take a minute to thank this week's video sponsor, Blinkist. Blinkist takes non-fiction books and condenses them down into little 15-minute briefs with all the highlights which you can then read or listen to podcast style on your phone. So my New Year's resolution this year for 2021 was to learn more and to read more about things that I just don't know anything about. But if you're like me, you're going to be busy, you don't really have a lot of time. So I've been using Blinkist to whittle it down, essentially, and decide which books I do want to fully read, like Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, which talks about the science of sleep, why we do it, why we dream, and what happens to our bodies physically when we don't get enough of it. 
So if you want to check Blinkist out, head to Blinkist.com forward slash Dr. Becky. That's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y. The link is in the description below. The first 100 people to go there are going to be able to get unlimited access to Blinkist for a whole week to try out completely free. And if you then decide to go and do the full membership at the end of that week, you'll also get 25% off as well. So I'm really hoping that that will help some of you out with your New Year's resolutions if they're learning based like mine. So thank you very much to Blinkist. I mean, it's still incredible to me that we got that level of detail from the New Horizons mission as it did its flyby of Pluto. Like thinking back on like the best image we had of Pluto before, right? From the Hubble Space Telescope, it was just this like dirty fl- fluzzbub. Fluzzbub's a word. <laughs>